Thanks to Rachel for inviting me. Thanks for Megan and Hadley and Alan and Jay for uh, setting this up. Um, I've known Rachel for some time and uh, it's great to see her work here and I've been invited to talk about her work. I wrote it out. Um, what I'd like to do is talk less about specific works than the general spirit of what I think I see that motivates the work. Um, I'm happy to talk about specific works after, um, but really that's the goal, because I think I recognize the spirit emanating in the works as something that I believe in and emanates from other works, which I think is particularly important now. And so that's what I'd like to talk about. So here it goes. The title is um, On Rachel Harrison or What is Non Salvific Art? <clears throat> the experience of standing in front of a mirror neatly illustrates a facet of our vision as prosaic as it is perverse. We tend to see only what we pay attention to. When we look into, say, a bathroom mirror or a hallway mirror, our focus intuitively falls on ourselves, as opposed to all that is perceivable in the mirror's surface. We are what we see most in a reflection. But even when our attention is on ourselves, what registers in our field of vision is often motivated by aspects of our face or body that confirms or justifies our attention in the first place. So, for instance, if we want to look good, we may only see parts of our face that needs tending to. Or, for whatever reason, if we feel ugly or unwanted, we may pay more heed to how our body or face fits this feeling, even to the point where it distorts what is being reflected in front of us. The subjective nature of our vision does not hamper what we see as much as highlight how what is perceivable is bound to internal states as expressed in thoughts and feelings. These inner expressions influence how quickly we grasp the features that genuinely interest us from all that is presented in our lines of sight. Seeing is what we do when we think and feel enough about someone or something to attend to them with our eyes. I am not suggesting, as some philosophers and people with debilitating hallucinations believe, that the world as it stands is quote-unquote mind-dependent, where reality manifests in our mind and mind only. The world surely exists independently of us as we intuitively know. It is just that our perceptual understanding is dynamic and parsimonious, perhaps necessarily so, since these qualities give us the advantage of being able to more quickly filter out inconsequential features in our field of vision so that what truly draws us, draws our interest insofar as what satisfies our appetite for entertaining certain thoughts and feelings can be apprehended faster. Is our sense of sight as dynamic and parsimonious when we look at art? Do we pay more attention to those aspects of an artwork that are more apt to correlate with our ongoing concerns, thoughts, and feelings? And do we naturally judge those aspects as what ought to be appreciated in the artwork as a whole? It is worth noting that the very term art confers upon whatever form of expression deemed as such with a quality that may be baked in, quote unquote, semantically speaking. This quality is captured when the term art is used in other common contexts, like when we say the art of something, as for example, the art of basketball. The art suggested here refers to how basketball is played at its highest form and where the experience of the game is being pursued at its optimal level. The same goes for the phrase, the state of art, where typ which typically means the best that can be developed or achieved in any endeavor. As someone with a peculiar enthusiasm for antiquity, I can't help but see how strikingly similar the word art is to arete, which is the anglicized translation of the ancient Greek word and concept that roughly translates as excellence. 
It is not uncommon to consider art as something that acts like a mirror which reflects society. But if this is the framework we have in mind, it is also not uncommon for a habitual expectation to crop up whenever we find ourselves where art is supposed to be. This habitual expectation is that art should reflect that which resembles the best of who we are. We look at art in part to find likenesses that reflect the best of who we imagine ourselves to be as a, resem as a semblance of the excellence that the very term art conceptually and historically suggests. There are, I imagine, as many kinds of human excellences worth identifying with as there are varieties of human kinds. The reality, however, is that some human excellences are prized more than others. What gets prized, socially speaking, hinges on the economic, political, cultural, and spiritual forces that influence any given society. Art considered socially means, among other things, art viewed in light of the kinds of human excellences it promotes and resembles, and how this light illuminates the promises and threats that define the times in which the art appears. So, for example, the pleasure of appreciating paintings that are staunchly representational, that depict what could not be mistaken as anything other than what can be viewed by the naked eye, can be understood as the satisfaction of identifying with the perceived respect and power from the cultivation of highly skilled and specialized labor. As another example, works made in the spirit or lineage of conceptualism may be seen as valuable or praiseworthy because they make available a form of human excellence worthy of being in accord with. The power of critical discernment made possible by intellectual ingenuity. The satisfaction gained from experiencing conceptual and post-conceptual works, and even works intended as explicit forms of political or social critique, is arguably derived in part from how pleasing it is to embrace the critical skills animating those works as a reflection of our own intellectual fa faculties and political dispositions, which we wish to value and be recognized for, and for which we believe or wish to believe animates us. I want to suggest that there's a particular relationship between the arete art inspires to identify, us to identify with and the aesthetic quality the work claims for itself as to why it ought to be valued. The binding agent for this relationship is the notion of authority. The more self-regarding an artwork is about what it wants to achieve, the more totalizing a work appears and the more commanding it tends to be over the kinds of human excellence there is av available for identification. Works like this place specific demands on how it is read and how it ought to be appreciated. The demandingness is a part of its aesthetic. So is the quality of self-certainty, which appears as a compositional coherency that verges on repetition. There is also an eagerness to create a sense of wholeness by integrating all the elements into a sum that works as one. Art made in this spirit gains currency as a formal expression of authority. The concept of authority exists in the history of ideas as a link in a chain of associations that include notions like autonomy, sovereignty, and unsurprisingly, arete or excellence. Aristotle described the excellent person, one who is in full command over every aspect of their lives and who is impervious to pain, suffering, and interestingly, the opinions of others, as someone who is capable of, quote unquote, being up to oneself. Art that offers us a reflection of what it, like, what it looks like to be up to oneself, I call salvific art. It is salvific because what catches the eye most is how it expresses the qualities that define authority as a kind of human excellence worth identifying with. 
the allure of salvific art may come down to how it gratifies our desire to protect ourselves from various winds of change and the overwhelming structural inequalities that bring such meaningless and arbitrary misery. Salvific art encourages us, encourages us to enlarge our own self-certainty and self-regard by inviting us to see how good it looks when something has the full authority to totally control all aspects of what it is and how it wants to be seen. What does non-salvific art look like? There may be no better way to start than by simply quoting from some of what has been written so far about the works in this exhibition. Defy description. Inability to land on a single reading. Scrambling for a message. No easy answer. Open-ended. And my personal favorite, disturbing sense of randomness. People seem to have no trouble recognizing that the works are willfully incoherent, but it sounds as if they are at a loss as to how to present this persistent and at times exuberant disordering <clears throat> and how it can be characterized into a virtue that reflects what we may want or need to see in ourselves today. Because what exactly is the worth of identifying with what defies description? or attending to that which is incapable of cohering into a single meaning or purpose, or declines to answer for itself, and may disturb us by how random and open-ended it looks and feels. Zenea is an ancient Greek term. It means hospitality to strangers, foreigners, travelers far from home, and generally those who are not our kind and kin. The word xenophobia, which has much more currency today, is etymologically derived from xenia. Keeping this lovely concept xenia in mind is how we might discern the kind of human excellence that is embodied in art like Rachel's. Experiencing these works offers us an opportunity to rekindle our capacity to not be afraid and perhaps even find fellow feeling, if not outright pleasure, when faced with what seems to us at first blush to be strange or foreign or outside our circles of concern. It is interesting to me that the words used to depict Rachel's work echo to some degree how immigrants and foreigners are described in certain political circles. Those who covet authority naturally see others who do not recognize the virtue of authority and who are indifferent or even hostile to being integrated into totalizing arrangements as incomprehensible or disturbing. People who are attracted to authority tend to be inhospitable to those who look strange and foreign to them. Works that are non-salvific never seems ready or willing to be up to oneself because they resist building the self-certainty and self-regard that announces authority's appearance. The unwillingness to be up to oneself does not diminish the capacity for the work to matter to us. Instead, what it discloses, if we are open enough to see, is how vivid and festive it looks when we let go of the need to be protected from those, from what that does not immediately or naturally fit in the framework of who we think we are or ought to be. Non-salvific art emerges from a way of thinking I call other-mindedness, making room for other kinds of elements and features within a work and composing them such that their qualitative differences are heightened and showcased rather than diminished, makes work look and feel cunning, dynamic, even thrilling. This species of art wholly is wholly, seems wholly uninterested in portraying itself as an authority worth following and harbors no illusions about being a safe haven for preserving or enlarging our self-certainty or self-regard. What it offers instead encourages us to identify with and appreciate what it's like 
to be an ensemble to oneself. It is a reflection of a state of being that accepts and welcomes contingencies and differences as crucial aspects of how we come to be at all. Being hospitable to entities and processes both foreign and domestic and inviting them into our designs enlarges what is made and what it is capable of becoming. The risk is that as the arrangements complexify, it may turn strange and unrecognizable, even to the designer herself. A radical uncertainty looms. And yet, here they still are, gathering, mulling, gathering, standing, mulling about in corners. They seem none the worse for it, not knowing exactly what they're supposed to be or what gives them the right to belong here in their first place. What's more, they seem to tolerate, even revel, in the irreconcilability that they openly bear as if they're saying, hey, you, look, it's okay to not want to be up to oneself and oneself only. The openness with how these works entertain and are themselves entertained by the contradictory relations and impulses on display may account for why they look so raucous, even funny. I consider laughing a philosophical act. It is the most self-reflective and open-hearted way to grapple with the irreconcilability of things. It is how we permit ourselves to feel what should not be, but is, without being hurt by that feeling. This quality of permissibility these works engender may be the arete I identify with most. It reminds me of an intuition I hold dear, but some lose sight of sometimes. And that is the feeling that it takes more than the attention I pay to what I want and need to be a version of me worth being. Entertaining other possibilities about who I am and what I'm capable of takes an outward facing openness to all that is not like me, to invite them into the picture, so to speak. Because the truth is, no matter how self-certain we are about who we are supposed to be, no one becomes genuinely someone on their own. Thanks. <laughs>
practice that to a lesser degree. I may simply be more authoritarian. Do you know what I mean? Like there is an instinct as artists to put all the elements together to make what I said, to bring the sum into one, you know, because you want it to come together. How many, how many grad school critiques have we heard where, where people, people uh, applaud people who make work that come together? You know what I mean? And that's cool, but I'm not into that. I need works that show me how irreconcilable things are because that's what it feels like, not only within me, but just the terrain. And I think it's rare to find those works that use elements. So, and, and when I say elements, I mean the broadest sense of elements. Ideas, trash, found objects, made things. Put them in a relationship where it feels not only tense, but maybe irreconcilable. And I think that's what, that's what I see. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Fifty years ago. Uh, I'm. It's a great question. I'm not an art historian. I think Rauschenberg tried. Um, I think Rauschenberg tried. I, that's my first blush. Um, I think, in, and there are many ways to be irreconcilable, you know? You can hold the irreconcilability within the framework of the composition, or you can simply be a jerk and make something that, 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 that is a force field to everything around it. Maybe Warhol did that early on. Do you know what I mean? Um, but Rauschenberg, to me, is at first blush the person I think of. I have a second question. What's that? You were, uh, yes, okay, sure. Anyone, is that okay? Yeah. Okay, sure, great. Sure. What's your name? Uh, Neil. Hi, Neil. That's Bob. Hi, He's my lawyer. <laughs> Badlands lawyer, not my artist lawyer. I won't ask the question. I'm sorry, I say that a lot. I'm sorry. What was your question, Neil? There's an assemblage of irreconcilable works here in front of us. Uh huh. Does it matter in the juxtaposition that there is? I, I want to believe that there is. And my sense of the installation is that, uh, is that there is an impulse for a certain rhythm and a certain level of surprise. When I first walked into this room, I was surprised to see this. You know, I, I don't think Rachel would call this what I called it, but I thought I walked into a weird, bizarro version of Caesar's Palace. <laughs> it was like, what is this? You know what I mean? There's a grandeur to it that isn't announced in any of the rooms. And then you walk in and here it is. So I think I, my instinct is that Rachel understands that level of um, tension and surprise. And I think my guess is she thought a lot about how that tension and that level of surprise can be maximized. So my guess is her assemblage mattered a lot. So if that's true, is there a sense of authority in the position? Oh, that's a very good question. I think you have hit upon the core paradox of what I'm talking about. And that I can't answer. But maybe one way to broach it, maybe what actually Rauschenberg talked about. You know, because um, I just did it. I'm not going to name drop. Anyways, um, you know, Rauschenberg talked about how um, he was in collaboration with the materials he was working in. That he never wanted to dominate the material. That in many ways, in, uh, he wanted to collaborate with the house paint the canvas, the goat, to work with, to find some composition worthy of both of them. And so maybe, uh, maybe one way to think about the, uh, whether or not you're an authority about composing is whether or not you're looking to dominate the material as opposed to working with the material. That's my sense of it. Thank you.
I can't speak to that, but the man sitting behind you might. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Do you want to talk about it? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. But as a viewer, as someone who experiences it, um, what I pick up on is the tension, it, the contradictory nature. It's everything from what it is to how it looks, you know, to how it plays against the kind of blobular, you know, the kind of almost like um, the alien form that parodies as art. It's, it's, the tension to me is very intentional, um, but I don't know, I don't know. It's also, it's also, it makes me think also, Paul, there's a real lightness of articulation among a lot of things. A lot of this, like this workout device you see on the multicolored spectrum. Mm. Things just don't really kind of crop on other things. Sometimes they're bad, but more, more often than not, the articulation is very, it's very subtle. Yeah, yeah, and mulling about. Right, like right, right. Um, and even I think that there's a sort of stronger articulation, like in, um, sorry, like, I forget the name of the satellite dish. Uh, Sun That even, even that is much more part of the sculpture. Uh, and you can see that it's, you know, articulated more, like, really part of the. Right. And I think this speaks to also the kind of, um, um, the, uh, how do I put this, um, the kind of infectious quality about some of her works. Like you don't know where the art ends and where it begins. Like you don't, it just seeps out in a way, you know? And I think that's part of, um, that's part of the, uh, that's part of uh, what well, just the nature of her work. But also not knowing the uncertainty, the radical uncertainty where she can use any and all materials to make things as tense and strange as possible. The question is, is there a conflict between non -self, what I characterize as non scientific art and museums? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But I think, to me, the greater conflict is actually um, what we need out of art today. Um, because I think, um, it's, it, to me, it's interest, Rachel's work comes in an interesting time today. Because, to me, when things are so tough and mean, we want self-certainty and self-regard as a way of protecting ourselves. And I think, um, it's a legitimate way of thinking about how we protect ourselves from the float sand and jet sand of these incredibly punishing times. But I personally don't feel protected by it. Uh, I want work that reminds me that I have to face outward to things that are not like me. And to, and to show that it's okay to take those things in and it's okay that things are irreconcilable that things still stand, and that things are worthy of belonging to places like this. So I think to me, it's not a moral outlook. As I, don't, I don't know what it is. It's just a feeling, you know? And I don't mean to suggest that art that is salvific is bad, kind, maybe. Um, <laughs> but I don't get much out of it. What I get out of looking at work that feels author authoritative to me is it wants me to feel authoritative. That's the identification. And I don't know if it's worth me feeling authoritative to be an authority to live better. I, I just, that's an open question to me. So. Hi. Hey. Um, based on No, I think Rachel's been making work like this for a long, whether or not the time. I think, you know, I've personally known her since the early 2000s. 
Um, and the work has changed, shifted, but the spirit remains the same. And I think, um, and I think the spirit remains the same because Rachel is Rachel. And she's attracted to certain things, certain impulses and aesthetics. And it's, and that, sh you know, and that uh, manifests itself in different forms in different works. But I, I don't, I don't see, uh, I don't. What, what's different to me is the contrast between the times in which we live in and the works. That's what I see most, mostly. Um, which is why I think it's such an interesting time to show her work. I want to thank you for coming, and uh, I hope you uh, look at the work some more. Great, thank you. Thank you.